And just for everyone joining here, we're just waiting for the full quorum before beginning. But we'll plan to do that shortly. <clears throat> And Brian, I'm not sure if you know everyone's uh, phone number, if one of those was potentially a member calling in. I know one is Joe, but I there's another number that I'm not sure whose it is, the one ending in uh, eight six. Oh, and there's another one, uh, 480 area code ending in 48. So if those who are on the call, um, could either send an email to medicaidpharmacy at utah.gov or uh, some other way let us know who you are and who you're affiliated with. That, that would be helpful. All right, Michelle's here. Brian, just double check my math here. We're, we're waiting for either Christopher, Clinton, or McKay. Is that? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sheffield's not going to be in the meeting today. He let me know ahead of time. Okay. Valentine or Robinson? I don't know if you have Drs. Robinson or um, Valentine's numbers available if we want to send a text message or something to see if they're planning to join. Dr. Hoffman, thanks for putting that in the chat there. I can, we can certainly understand that. <clears throat> Brian, it's my understanding there's no business we can undertake right now without a quorum. Is that? That okay. is correct. And Tony could elucidate that further. With our... <laughs> That's right. Okay. Do you really want a long answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, McKay will be on in just a moment. Excellent. Thanks for double checking with him. 
And with uh, Dr. Hoffman having to leave um, in a in a at seven thirty, it looked like. Um, will we have to get all motions in before then? Assuming Dr. Valentine doesn't join us. Tony, do you want to answer that? Yes. Yeah, that was yeah that was my impression. Just making sure. That's what I thought. Too. Yes. Yeah. The the, the uh, committee cannot do business without the quorum. Tony, can we do the training without a quorum? This is Joe with the with Medicaid. Yes, because that uh, so, while that is required by the legislature, uh, it does not take a quorum vote. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. if so maybe flip them or yeah, I, I'm happy to um, put your section up first, Tony. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, I would like to first of all express the uh, appreciation to the committee members for your service and professionalism. Uh, part of the training today is uh, mandatory, required by the Utah legislature. It does not imply that there has been uh, some issues. In fact, with the uh, uh, committee here, uh, it has been exemplary in its uh, behavior and conduct, so I commend you for that. Uh, remember, the Open and Public Meetings Act is here for the purpose of ensuring that the people's business in the state of Utah is conducted openly, that the deliberations are uh, conducted openly, and that the public has the opportunity to participate in them. And so for the training today, what we're going to do is watch a news clip that was broadcasted uh, last year about a uh, particular school board that did not follow the protocols of the Open and Public Meetings Act. Some of you may recall it. And what I would ask is that as we go through and watch this uh, relatively short clip, that you notice how it was initiated, why it was initiated. And I'm talking about this, you know, news piece on uh, a local uh, channel. And what did they find? Was it directly related to what initiated or did they find a lot of other things? And then at the end of <clears throat> the video, I will uh, give you the opportunity to share with the group what you identify as concerns for you. Now, not everyone will be in this school district, but as a public member, what concerns do you have with the behavior that was uh, reported on in this particular article. So let me pull this up right quick. And if you can't hear it, Brian, if you would let me know, I would appreciate it. All right. A Fox 13 News investigation has uncovered name calling, insults, profanity, and general dysfunction within the Salt Lake City School Board. Some of it has been public during meetings to discuss the district's response to COVID-19, but not all of it. Fox 13's Adam Herbetz joins us now with what we found. Well, Kelly, Salt Lake City is still Utah's only public school district that is online only. No kids allowed in the classroom. The records we've reviewed show the COVID-19 debate has led to some unprofessional and possibly unethical behavior by school board members. The Salt Lake City School District has seven board members, but only a few were willing to speak to Fox 13 about the messages they thought would remain private. I'm sorry about that. Um, Catherine needs to lead right. on what we're talking about. And I'd like to end this meeting now. Some parents have complained about a lack of professionalism at meetings. 
I've seen the chat. This is this is um, this. You know, I've seen myself get roasted in the chat. Um, okay. I, this is an important I'm not part. Seeing, this is this is one parent decided to take it a step further. What's going on behind the scenes that? We're not being told. Raina Williams, who has five children in the district, filed a public records request asking for copies of school board emails and text messages. Together, we read hundreds of them. I can't believe you went through all those emails. And some stood out more than others. I'll let you read it because there's some words not appropriate for church. You gotta be kidding me. On July 21st, Catherine Kennedy was upset when the board meeting didn't end on time. We've never stopped at a hard stop when Melissa. Instead of leaving early, she started typing a colorful message to board president Melissa Ford. I would never talk that way about colleagues or clients. And if that's a language she uses to express herself, then evidently she can go back to school and get some more English words that she can use without using felt. I move that we adjourn now. With that, the meeting ended just a few weeks before the start of school, but still no reopening plan for more than 20,000 kids and their parents to start getting ready. Mm. Mm. During that same meeting, board member Mike Nemelka wasn't texting. I'm technology illiterate. I don't send texts to anybody. But he was playing solitaire. I'm not going to lie. I'm sure I did, you know, but I knew what was going on. And playing solitaire is no different than those guys in there texting while they're listening to what's going on. Records show board members Nate Salazar and Sam Hansen exchanged at least 200 text messages, often complaining about parents or principals who disagree with their opinion to keep students online. I'm frustrated that a decision hasn't been made yet. One of their targets was Jared Wright, the principal of West High. Gosh, guys, like that's just so backhanded. Jared Wright was the principal of uh, two of my sons. He has an excellent reputation. In some cases, they don't respect the principals at all. Mike Namelka's biggest concern has to do with emails, especially the ones that were intentionally sent to everyone except him. Thought you might be interested in an additional set of school safety concerns. I have not bothered to send it to Mr. Namelka since I doubt you will be receptive. That's clearly against district policy, and Namelka believes it's also a violation of Utah's Open and Public Meetings Act, a state law that is supposed to stop elected officials from privately colluding on public policy. The penalty is a Class B misdemeanor. I was taught this the very first year I was there. You can't even send an email to four people. It's pretty obvious from watching the board meetings that anytime Michael tries to speak he's kind of written off masks do the job do you think that there are things missing yes absolutely three of the board members did not supply complete text messages are you michelle yeah my name's adam i'm with fox 13 with the news Hi. michelle tui tupo says that's because she typically deletes her messages which she started doing even before joining the school board Nate Salazar and Catherine Kennedy have ignored multiple requests for comment. They need to be very transparent of what's going on. I tried to get along with them all, but they just don't think the same way I do. We reached out to the spokesperson for the Salt Lake City School District. She referred us to the employee handbook, which indicates there are likely multiple violations here. Otherwise, the district would not comment. You can read all of the messages between board members that we've received on Fox 13 now. Well, <clears throat> obviously those individuals on the uh, school board were not planning on their text messages, their emails uh, becoming public, but it appears that there was a bleed over from the business that was being conducted by the committee uh, into their uh, emails, into conversations outside of the board meeting, uh, that, you know, in hindsight, I'm sure they wish they would not have, particularly their lack of professionalism. So do any of the uh, committee members want to throw out any 
uh, things that jumped out at them as uh, what they would perceive as violating uh, what should be uh, kept public and discussed in uh, meetings. Certainly omitting members from an email thread would, <clears throat> would raise some concerns from my end. Yes. I think the unprofessional text messages going back and forth is that's a problem. Yes, absolutely. Also, and, texting during a meeting between members that's not made public to all members, obviously, is a violation. Agreed. Absolutely. I actually wrote a list and came up with uh, 10 different items. And so we won't, uh, because of timing and the need for the uh, committee to uh, move forward with business, I will not go through all of them. But I think this is an excellent example of how uh, one issue, when examined, uncovers a lot of other problems. And the last thing that the committee wants to do is to find itself in one of these news stories, because in every one of the news articles, almost every one that we uh, search for and, and pull up every year. It's never the intent of the committee to have attention drawn to themselves. Uh, they believe what they're doing is fine. Uh, you know, their professional conduct, they, they believe is just fine. But yet, uh, when, when it's viewed by a third party, they realize that it is really problematic. So just as a, a brief reminder, number one, always keep your guard up. Always remember that anything in the committee, uh, in the business and your relation with it and your communications about it potentially could become public and could be reported on in the media. Uh, thank you in the past for keeping it professional. I would encourage you to, to continue to keep your behavior on the professional level. Uh, number two, remember, even though it's your personal phone or your personal email, if that's what you're using, it is subject to disclosure, uh, as happened down in the Bridalville uh, Falls uh, incident with the county commission, as with many other instances, uh, including one from the attorney general's office, where all of their personal devices were seized and all of the information that they'd ever text on it was scanned through to determine if there was any violations of law. And part of that was dealing with the Open and Public Meetings Act. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this reminder that everything that we do uh, for the government needs to be kept in mind that it is uh, for uh, public discussion. It is for public input because that is whom we are serving. So with that, I'll ask if there's any questions that anyone would like to field. If so, that's fine. Uh, just uh, chime in. I, I've got a question about uh, more administrative type tasks. Um, you know, for example, talking to a, a staff member about running a timer or, you know, you know, just little things like that, that maybe aren't within the meeting chat or, or texting someone to say, hey, just a reminder about the meeting. Are you going to be able to make it? something like that well obviously that is a permissible behavior because it's administrative uh, for example <clears throat> this morning contacting individuals uh, to ensure that there was a quorum uh, that's not a problem you just have to remember that under a different act uh, the you know the government records access management act that potentially you know could become uh, or that would be public information so, uh, you know, the, the individual's telephone number may not be, you know, the address could be protected. Uh, there's some other privacy issues there, but uh, most of what, uh, you know, you do, Brian, and the staff that support you, uh, that is public information, either under grandma or Open and Public Meetings Act, but it's not something that has to be disclosed on the agenda. It's not something there has to be notice provided. Minutes of it do not have to be provided. And if you have further questions on that, we can discuss that offline as well, too. Be happy to uh, entertain those questions. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Okay, if not, I'll drop off and, and say thank you for your service again. And I wish uh, everyone a, a very productive and happy day. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Tony. Thank you. Very important. All right, we'll <clears throat> move to the next item of business here. I think everyone has the um, minutes from the November meeting. Yep. Um, okay. You kind of cut out there, Brian, but I was going to make a motion to approve or second it, depending on what you. I was going to note that we have a quorum now. Perfect. That was what I had seen as well. Excellent. So I will make a motion to approve the minutes from November. If everyone would like to review those. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Clayton. And we'll, if everyone has reviewed them beforehand, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion passes to approve the minutes. And we will move on to our next agenda item for today. Um, the DUR board update. Good morning, everyone. So the DUR board met in December to review the prophylaxis hereditary angio edema with the recommendation from the board to use a ready ZPA for the medication treatment. The board met in January to review lupus nephritis, and due to the low utilization of the medication, the board has recommended to not apply PA to Benlista olopkinase. And in February, the board had reviewed codeine use in children, and the board recommended to update the a image in cough and cold and pain codeine product to be in compliance with the FDA label change in the warning on those. Um, the March DUR meeting has now canceled, and um, any future meeting is to be determined. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. I think the next one, um, we have Dr. Lulo. I apologize if I got that pronunciation incorrect for the non-steroidal treatments for atopic dermatitis. Okay, I will go ahead and get those slides presented. Okay, everyone should see those slides now. Um, thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Monet Lulo. Uh, today we will be reviewing non-steroidal products that are either under FDA review, referred to as emerging, or approved to treat atopic dermatitis or AD. Treatment options for AD depends on disease severity. U.S. guidelines do not give an explicit definition of mild, moderate, or severe AD. In general, mild AD tends to affect less body surface area, resolves over time, and is associated with minor itch intensity. In contrast, moderate to severe AD tends to affect a larger body surface area expresses a continuous progression and is associated with more severe itching. Usually topical therapies are utilized for mild to moderate disease, whereas systemic treatment is reserved for more severe cases. This slide lists the FDA approved non-steroidal topical agents for the treatment of AD. There are three different classes of topical agents. Crisoboral is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, pemicrolimus and tacrolimus are calcineurin inhibitors, and rexalitinib is a Janus kinase or JAK inhibitor. Most topical products are approved for moderate to severe AD except for tacrolimus, which is approved for moderate to severe disease. All topicals are approved for use in the adult and pediatric population. Crisoboral is approved for use at the youngest age of greater than or equal to three months, both topical calcineurin inhibitors or TCIs are indicated for individuals two years of age and older, and rexalinib is indicated for those 12 years of age and older. Pemicrolimus, tacrolimus, and rexalinib are for use after failure of other topical prescription options. These products are applied to the affected areas twice daily. Generic equivalents are available for pemicrolimus and tacrolimus only. 
This slide shows the FDA-approved systemic agents. This includes two subcutaneously administered monoclonal antibodies, dupilumab and tralokinumab, and two oral JAK inhibitors, abracitinib and upacitinib. Each systemic product is indicated for moderate to severe AD among patients unresponsive or intolerant to topical treatments. Labeling for abracitinib and upacitinib specifies that these agents are only for refractory cases that are uncontrolled by other systemic agents, such as biologics, or when other systemic agents cannot be used. All of the listed products are approved for use in adults. Only dupilumab and upacitinib are indicated for the pediatric population. The biologic products, dupilumab and tralokinumab, are administered subcutaneously every two weeks. Administration of tralokinumab every four weeks is an option for select patients with a positive response after the initial 16 weeks of treatment. The oral JAK inhibitors, abracitinib and upacitinib, are administered once daily. Dupilumab and upacitinib have additional approved indications. Dupilumab is indicated as add-on maintenance treatment for certain types of asthma in patients six years of age and older, and as add-on treatment for chronic rhinosinitis with nasal polyposis in adults. Upacitinib is approved for psoriatic arthritis and moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis in adults with an intolerance or an adequate response to one or more tumor necrosis factor or TNF antagonist. An additional systemic oral JAK inhibitor, baricitinib, is under FDA review for the treatment of moderate to severe AD in adults, but has already been approved in Europe for this use. Baricitinib is already FDA approved for the treatment of moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis in adults with a previous failure or intolerance to one or more TNF antagonists. U.S. guidelines predate FDA approval for most agents reviewed except for pimecrolimus and tacrolimus. There are more recent European guidelines, which include some of the newer agents. U.S. and European guidelines recommend pimecrolimus and tacrolimus for acute and non-continuous chronic treatment for individuals two years of age and older who have failed to respond or have an intolerance to other topical prescription treatments, such as corticosteroids. The guidelines do not state a preference for one TCI over another. However, TCIs are preferred to topical corticosteroids or TCSs in certain situations. During pregnancy, the European Task Force on Atopic Dermatitis favors the use of topical tacrolimus over topical pimecrolimus due to the greater amount of data with systemic use during pregnancy. Regarding systemic therapies, NICE recommends dupilumab or baricitinib as alternative options for adults with moderate to severe AD, unresponsive or intolerant to at least one other systemic immunosuppressant agent, such as cyclosporin, methotrexate, or azathioprine. The 2018 consensus-based European guideline recommends dupilumab for moderate to severe AD in adults in which disease control is not achieved with topical treatment or a contraindication exists and it's not suitable to use other systemic agents similar to those NICE mentions. Based on an updated European position paper from 2020, dupilumab is recommended for individuals 12 years of age and older with moderate to severe AD requiring systemic therapy. The majority of head-to-head -head evidence suggests that tacrolimus is more effective at treating AD symptoms and produces more rapid relief compared to pimecrolimus among children and adults with varying disease severity. Regarding safety, numerically more events of local application site reactions such as burning, pain, and warmth occurred with tacrolimus compared to pimecrolimus. However, the difference was not statistically significant. One randomized controlled trial each compared standard doses of dupilumab to abracitinib or upacitinib among patients with moderate to severe AD. Results show that the higher dose of upacitinib of 30 mg daily is more effective than dupilumab at improving AD symptoms in patients 12 years and older at 16 weeks. A quicker onset of action and greater improvements in skin clearance was observed with upacitinib compared to dupilumab. Of note, the initiation dose of 15 milligrams once daily was not studied. 
In the abracitinib study, comparable efficacy was observed at week 16 for both agents. However, the higher end dose of abracitinib produced a significant reduction in itch response by week two, suggesting an earlier onset of action compared to dupilumab. Nausea occurred more frequently with abracitinib compared to dupilumab. Rates of acne, serious infection, and serious adverse events were numerically higher with either JAK inhibitor at the higher dose, whereas rates of conjunctivitis were higher among patients that received dupilumab. There were no other head-to-head -head studies identified for the remaining agents. Tables 11 and 12 of the report provide a full list of warnings and precautions for each agent. For the sake of time, I'll just highlight black box warnings or some drug class effects. The TCIs carry a black box warning for a possible increased risk of malignancy and a recommendation to avoid continuous long-term use due to the lack of established long-term safety data. Other select warnings include a possible, possible risk of immunosuppression and to avoid sun exposure during use. The JAK inhibitors, abracitinib, baricitinib, ruxolitinib, and upacitinib carry a black box warning for the risk of serious infections, serious thrombotic events, and increased risk of all-cause mortality, malignancy, and major cardiovascular events. There are no black box warnings for the remaining approved agents. The biologics, dupilumab and tralokinumab have warnings for hypersensitivity reactions and the development of conjunctivitis and keratinitis. The only warning for crisoboral is regarding the risk of hypersensitivity. In summary, clinical practice guidelines recommend topical treatments for mild to moderate AD and escalation to systemic therapies when topical treatments fail or when disease is more severe. All systemic non products are indicated for moderate to severe AD. U.S. guidelines do not state a preference for one TCI over another, but they do recommend TCIs over TCSs in certain situations. Head-to-head -head evidence suggests that topical tacrolimus may be more effective than pemicrolimus, but it may have a higher incidence of local application site reactions. Head-to-head -head evidence among individuals with moderate to severe AD suggests that the higher dose of upacitinib is more effective than dupilumab at improving signs and symptoms, and both upacitinib and abracitinib had a faster onset of action compared to dupilumab at skin clearance and relieving itch, respectively. Dupilumab has the advantage of having FDA approval of other atopic conditions, such as asthma and chronic rhinosinitis, which are common comorbidities among patients with AD. Abracitinib and tralokinumab are approved only for use in adults. The safety profile of non agents varies based on the formulation and generally by class. The board may consider recommending at least one non topical product that is FDA indicated for pediatric AD as preferred on the PDL as AD predominantly affects children in most of these cases requiring pharmacologic therapy will start with topical treatment. Also, the board may consider recommending at least one systemic biologic agent that is FDA approved for moderate to severe AD as preferred on the PDL. Depending on the location and severity of lesions and percentage of body surface area affected, systemic therapy may be more appropriate or required versus using topicals for moderate to severe disease. A biologic is specified in our recommendation because the label and indication of the other systemic agents, which are JAK inhibitors, specify that these are for use when another systemic agent, including biologics, have failed or cannot be advisably used. These systemic JAK inhibitors can be made accessible through a prior authorization. Among Medicaid fee-for-service pharmacy claims data, in 2021, the most utilized agents in order of frequency were dupilumab, pimacrolimus, tacrolimus, and crisoboral. Since dupilumab is also approved for additional indications, utilization likely reflects these uses too. Among children less than 18 years of age, the most utilized agent was pimacrolimus, followed by tacrolimus, dupilumab, and crisoboral. Keep in mind that utilization is also influenced by preference on the PDL. No utilization was identified for tralokinumab or ruxolinib. Abracitinib and upacitinib were not approved for AD until 2022. 
This concludes the presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much for that comprehensive and uh, review. Much appreciated. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Lulo, we'll take those now. Um, and Brian, just a procedural question. Um, Dr. Hoffman has left the meeting. I double checked and, and I was mistaken on the number we needed for the quorum. We needed five, not six. So we, we are still good. Okay. And that's what I thought. I, I wasn't sure if you were counting yourself and that's right. I appreciate the double check there. Great. Mm -hmm. So I believe barring any further questions, um, we'll move on to the public comment. I think first up, we've got Brandon Yip from Santa Fe Aventis, if he's on the call. Let's see. All right, and Dr. Yip, um, if you are talking right now, we cannot hear you. Why don't we... We can move to the next, I believe it's... Yep, let's move to the next one. We can circle back if needed. Yeah. Brian, I had Dr. Gutierrez from Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Gabriela Gutierrez. I'm a physician with Pfizer Medical Inflammation and Immunology. And I'm here today to ask you to add uh, Sabinco abracitinib to the formulary for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Spinco is a JAK inhibitor indicated for the treatment of adults with refractory moderate to severe atopic dermatitis whose disease is not adequately controlled with other systemic drug products, including biologics or when used or those. The therapy isn't visible. Sibinco is not recommended uh, for use in combination with other JAK inhibitors, biologic immunomodulators, or with other immunosuppressants. There is a box warning for serious infections, mortality, uh, malignancy, maze, and thrombosis. Please refer to Sevinco full prescription information available on the Pfizer public website for important treatment considerations, including box warning. Antiplatelets therapies are contraindicated uh, except for low dose aspirin during the first three months of treatment. Laboratory monitoring is recommended due to potential changes in platelets, lymphocytes, and lipids. Avoid use of live vaccines prior to, during, and immediately after Sabinco treatment. Incomplete any necessary immunization, including a herpes suxer vac vaccination before initiating treatment with Sabinco. The most common adverse event reactions equal or greater than 1% in subjects receiving abracitinib 100 and 200 milligrams include nasopharyngitis, nausea, headache, herpes simplex, increased CPK, acne, among others. The efficacy of Sabinco as monotherapy and in combination with background topical corticosteroids was evaluated in three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, trials 81, 82, and 83, which assess the primary endpoints of investigator level assessment and EC75 responses at week 12. In these trials, a higher proportion of subjects in both abracitinib arms uh, achieve an statistically significant improvement of the IGA score to clear or almost clear on a five-point scale. And EC75 improvement from baseline when compared with placebo at week 12. A higher proportion of subjects in Sabine monotherapy arms achieve improvement and itching at week 12 compared to placebo. And the proportion of subjects achieving PPNRS for our each score uh, at week two was higher in subjects treated with Sabinco, 100 and 200 milligrams once daily in combination with background medicated topical therapies when compared to placebo. Um, the, the recommended dose is 100 milligrams orally once daily. Uh, if not, uh, adequate response we can increase the dose to 200 milligrams after 12 weeks of treatment and Sabinco can be used with or without topical corticosteroids. Based on efficacy and safety of Sabinco, please consider our request. Thank you for your time and attention. And if you have any questions. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. And just a quick reminder I put in the chat, um, public comment is limited to three minutes. So thank you 
for for adhering to that. And I think we'll we'll hear all the public comment and then solicit questions. Brian, I don't have the next. Um, it looks like Brandon Yip is on. If we want to let him go for or go next, and then. Um, after that would be Muriel Lovesquez and Charlie Levan. Perfect. Dr. Yip, if you're available or on, we'll. All right. Okay, move. Yeah. Move on while we're maybe Hello. working out some. Oh, there we go. Yes. I'm so sorry about that. I've had some uh, <laughs> technical issues this morning. Okay. So um, very quickly, I just wanted to go over some uh, new information that we have on um, Dupilumab and some of the uh, new information that we have um, regarding uh, ICER and uh, real world evidence. So just very quickly, some comments on. Uh, real world evidence that we have. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we did complete a recent uh, real world evidence study over 12 months. And um, the study is called Believe AD. And um, it was um, done across patients through the Dupixent My Way program. And we collected a lot of great evidence within this uh, study. So within that study, um, we looked at a bunch of uh, patient reported outcomes, but I think the main keys of uh, this study showed that um, it established the long-standing efficacy and safety experience with Dupilumab over nearly five years on the market. Um, there's a couple of things that you guys, if you guys are interested, I can um, provide the citation to the manuscript. It was recently published, but it does look at um, things like treatment burden. Um, it does look at things where Patients have experienced efficacy and safety with dupilumab, and you can see that their use of concurrent therapies such as TCSs, TCIs is decreasing over time. And I think that one of the, um, the key things uh, out of the studies, it does reaffirm that um, the patients experience really good adherence and persistence for the product, right? Over a 30-day gap in treatment, persistence and adherence was around 90% for patients on uh, dupilumab. Understand that uh, atopic dermatitis is a, a disease of flares, waxing and waning, peaks and valleys, and some patients, you know, may discontinue the product. And we did find that with an average of 116 days, uh, patients that discontinue the product reinitiated the product, right? These patients are uh, moderate to severe, high IG score, high body surface area. And then the last point I just wanted to, um, you know, bring to the attention of the panel is that um, you know, the recent ICE report that was released at the end of the year uh, of 2021, they did an extensive study of dupilumab against competitors, right? And um, one of the th things that, again, was safety, right? The original report that came out in 2017 questioned the safety long-term for dupilumab. Not any specific adverse event, but just questioned the safety of using a biologic and atopic dermatitis. And the 2020, 2021 report that was recently released does kind of reaffirm the longstanding efficacy and safety with the product. And it does provide a lot of um, cost effectiveness um, comparisons against um, the other competitors on the market now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Yip. And we'll hear from Dr. Vasquez. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I'm here to talk to you about Adbury uh, Trelocanumab. It was just recently approved uh, in December 2021 as is the first human high affinity monoclonal antibody that specifically neutralizes interleukin-13. And interleukin-13 has been shown to be a key cytokine that drives inflammation in atopic dermatitis skin. This biologic is indicated for the treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis adult patients whose disease is not adequately controlled with topical prescription therapies or when these are not advisable. The recommended dose is an initial dose of 600 milligrams via subcutaneous injection followed by 300 milligrams self-administered every two weeks. But of note is a dosage of 300 milligrams every four weeks may be considered for patients who weigh below 100 kilos and who achieve clear or almost clear skin after being on treatment for 16 weeks. 
Uh, the safety and efficacy has actually been established in over 1,900 adult patients in three pivotal trials where it was well tolerated and demonstrated superiority over placebo in the primary endpoints of the IgA of 0, 1 um, or EZ75 score at week 16. And it was maintained the response out to week 32 and week 52 in, in different pivotal trials. Um, Furthermore, that every four-week dosing option was shown to be effective after 16 weeks of every two-week dosing. And for patients who are eligible, if they have their body weight under 100 kilos and their skin is clear, almost clear skin. Now, this can provide patients the lowest effective dose and fewer injections to maintain their control of their chronic disease. The majority of adverse events in the pivotal trials were non-serious, uh, mild or moderate in, sever in severity. And the overall frequency was comparable across treatment groups and did not increase during prolonged treatment of up to 52 weeks. The most common, just so you know, greater than 1% were upper respiratory tract infections, conjunctivitis, injection site reactions, and eosinophilia. So overall, ADBI represents a new option in the treatment paradigm for moderate to severe topic dermatitis adult patients. And with the option to provide a maintenance dosing of every four weeks for eligible patients, patients may be managed with fewer doses. So therefore, we ask that the committee consider adding ABRI to the preferred drug list as a preferred product for patients suffering from moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who had an inadequate response to topical prescription therapies. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Dr. Lovan. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Charlie Lovin with Medical Affairs at AVV. Thank you all so much for having me uh, to provide um, information on upadacitinib this morning, brand named Rinvoq. So my focus at this time is on the newest indication. Rinvoq has been approved uh, by the FDA to treat patients 12 and older with refractory moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, not adequately controlled with other systemic medications or when the use of those therapies is inadvisable. Um, the treatment should be initiated with 15 milligrams taken orally once daily. And if inadequate response is not achieved, providers should consider increasing the dose to 30 milligrams daily. Atopic <clears throat> dermatitis is one of the most common and most severe types of eczema and is characterized by itchy and inflamed skin. <clears throat> providers and patients with moderate to severe AD are looking for uh, treatment that will offer rapid reduction in itch and pain along with lessening of inflammation, redness, and thickening of the skin. Renvoq has differentiated itself from other medications currently available for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Renvoq at both 15 and 30 milligram daily doses met all primary and rank secondary endpoints in three 16, 16 week placebo controlled pivotal trials. Measure Up 1 and 2 looked at the monotherapy treatment of at, and add up was a trial that evaluated Renvoq in combination with topical corticosteroids. In these studies, the investigator noted a rapid onset of action. Over two-thirds of patients saw a statistically significant 75% improvement in skin symptoms after 16 weeks, and a significant reduction in itch was seen as early as day two with Rinvoq 30 milligrams and day three with 15 milligrams. In all of these studies, Rinvoq demonstrated disease control for adults and adolescents throughout the double-blind period with, the, with and without the use of topical corticosteroids. Rinvoq has a well-studied clinical profile with over 7,500 patients studied in the RA and psoriatic arthritis trials, and now with over 3,200 additional patients in the atopic dermatitis phase three, phase three program. The safety in the AD studies was consistent with previous trials in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. The most common adverse events seen in AD were upper respiratory tract infection, acne, headache, and nasopharyngitis. No MACE or VTE events were reported in the upadacitinib treatment groups. AVI will continue to observe patients to determine long-term safety with the upadacitinib across all indications. <clears throat> I know this has only been a short review. Please refer to the PI for full efficacy and safety information online at rxabvi.com. I do want to close by respectfully asking that Renvoke be added to the state preferred drug list for all indications, including atopic dermatitis. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Absolutely, thank you to our presenters today. Much appreciated. And now we'll move on to kind of the committee discussion and any questions. 
that have arisen from the presentations thus far? Uh, this is Joe with the state with uh, Medicaid. A, a question for uh, Dr. Lulo. Is there any data on combining uh, these uh, various medications or said another way, are there situations where that should not be a medication, these particular meds should not be combined? Uh, that is a great question. I know for the JAK inhibitors, you wouldn't want to use it with another JAK inhibitor. Um, in terms of combining topicals with a systemic agent, um, I believe that you could still use topical corticosteroids to control flares when they arise. Um, as was pre previously stated, this is a more relapsing remitting disease state. And I'm not sure about <laughs> combining other systemic therapies together. What about combining a systemic Thank therapy you. with something like a, a calcineurin inhibitor or, or topical Janus kinase uh, of Solora? Um, you can yeah. still use topical calcineurin inhibitors. Um, Do you know but, if there's been studies looking at um, efficacy of combination versus monotherapy? No, I I haven't seen that in terms of systemic agents. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I would open that same, the same. If any of you know anything about that. You kind of froze up, right? Oh. I was just asking if um, any of those who gave public comment might know about mono versus combination therapy, oral and topical. Brian, this is this is Charlie with AbV. So in in our in one of our trials that's in the the USPI, one of our phase three pivotal trials, there was combination therapy. Um, so it is um, appropriate to use combination topical therapy with the systemic agents at the prescriber's discretion. But there's nothing suggesting that you you couldn't do that with the uh, and to my knowledge, the other systemic agents as well that were discussed today. Thank you. So, so Dr. topical, Dr. Uh, Charlie, uh, um, this is Joe with Medicaid. Do you mean topical corticosteroids or or Elidel protopic? Sorry, I should have clarified. So topical corticosteroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors are the ones that I can Thank speak you. to specifically from the AbV trials. We Thank did not you. have any phase three trials with um, other topical agents such as the topical Jack or Eucrisa in our trials specifically. Thank you. And Dr. Vasquez uh, raised her hand as well to respond. Yes, to the same, um, we, our data shows um, in our clinical trial program, we did have trials with topical corticosteroids and many feel that's more real world actually. Um, and uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors can also be used, but no data with the topical jacks. Perfect, and Dr. Yip also raised his hand. Dr. Yip, it looks like you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Um, I wanted to just reiterate some of the comments and um, also wanted to bring up a point where, yes, there is concurrent therapy with topical steroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors. And um, patients, if they're following, um, you know, quad AI, AAD guidelines, right, the established guidelines out there, just wanted to remind the panel that it is a stepwise therapy, right? We are talking about biologics currently. However, um, in atopic dermatitis, you know, when they're diagnosing the patient, you're moving through those, you know, um, topicals first, you know, you're actually using emollient therapy, things that are treating the dryness and that barrier disruption of the skin. And then you're stepping up to the biological. One last point is that when we looked at our trials, those patients that were part of placebo did see efficacy, right? Because in a clinical trial setting, they were forced to use, you know, TCSs. They were forced to adhere to emollient therapy, right? They were compliant. 
So it does work. However, for these patients, right, there's an unmet need that their type 2 underlying inflammatory condition is so severe that they need a biologic. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Dr. Gutierrez, you also had your hand raised. Yeah, um, pretty much to echo what my colleagues uh, mentioned. Um, we have our combination trial as well with our CDNF, which is compare including topical corticosteroids and topical uh, calcineurin inhibitors. Um, no experience at all with other with topical jack inhibitors. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for that information. Um, yeah, and looking through the studies, there's a lot of specifically combined with topical corticosteroids, and then um, it looks like they would use that add-on for a topical calcineurin inhibitor. You could go back to that, but it seemed to be limiting that to about a week of time from what I was reading there. So great questions. And if we don't have any further questions, um, I would like to start moving towards some motions. So I'd, if anyone has any um, that were particularly sticking out for them, happy to hear those. I appreciate Dr. Lulo's recommendations as well in her summary. And so I'll, I'll start things off here. So it looked to me like we would <clears throat> include at least one non-steroidal topical product, um, FDA approved for pediatric atopic dermatitis. Um, did not look like there was much head to head as far as chrysoboral versus the calcineurin inhibitor. So I, don't, I didn't feel the need to specify that. I would like to hear from the other committee members. There does seem to be uh, topical tacrolimus does seem more effective than hemochrolimus, um, but also comes with a uh, greater side effect profile as well. Because of those issues, I I, I I think it is reasonable to um, maybe have some flexibility there, uh, you know, between those agents. I wouldn't want to say, well, you have to use one or the other, uh, um, or at least, you know, be locked into preferring one or versus the other. Um, the other thing that I would note is that seems like the stepwise approach is makes sense you've got the the topical agents for mild to moderate and then you have the systemic agents for moderate to severe and so that, i think that's something to keep in mind as we move forward and it looked like for the topical calcineurin inhibitors you would not want to use it continuously so what I was seeing is they seem to want um, to use them for about a year. And then there was an off period. I, I couldn't tell exactly from the studies what the recommended. Is it one month? Is it six months? I was having a hard time finding that information. But it seemed to be like you would not want to be on either of those continuously. Whereas for Chris Oboro, you could be on it more continuously. So another consideration as we're forming the motion. Um, and if someone from the DUR, could, it, it would be assumed that they have failed topical steroid therapy um, unless they had a contraindication either to a sensitive area, atopic dermatitis to a sensitive area or um, signs of atrophy and breakdown of the skin. We, we used to require a prior authorization for the calcineurin inhibitors uh, with a step through topical corticosteroids. We no longer have that in place. Um, so, I mean, hopefully prescribers are following an appropriate stepwise approach, but we don't currently have a prior authorization with that limitation. Well, certainly you don't want to use 
corticosteroids uh, in on the face, especially around the eyes for long periods of time, or in uh, on in flexural areas such as antecubital and et cetera. So the topical calcineurin inhibitors can be, you know, corticosteroid sparing in those areas where you may need uh, to uh, continue treatment as well. Thank you, Dr. Siegfried. Great. So uh, <clears throat> if there's any more discussion, please, please chime in. And I was going to I'll make a motion for considering at least one non-steroidal topical product um, FDA approved for pediatric atopic dermatitis on the PDL. I would second that. All right, and all four. Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any um, abstentions? All right. I think another thing to consider is um, taking the group as a whole and the possibility of having a class that would include all of these drugs as a, you know, as a possibility. So Brian, did we, do we want to amend the motion to include the? It, it could be a separate motion. I, I, I think it is reasonable to have a topical agent as preferred, even if we, if the class is not just limited to those topical agents. I had a question, Brian. Do other uh, states separate out topical versus uh, systemic, or do they combine them in other state reports? I, I haven't looked at the other states. Um, we could do it either way. I, I think, it, to me, it seems reasonable to put them all together in one class. Um, you know, if we chose to have a systemic therapy as preferred, then it would be on the same footing as the topical agents. Whereas if there was a topical agent preferred, it would uh, create that automatic step going through a preferred topical before going to a systemic. Uh, I, I think both approaches could be appropriate. Maybe I misunderstand that. Are you saying more than one topical non-steroidal before moving on to systemic or at least one? Preferred agent, then that, that would be the criteria for moving on to a non-preferred agent within the same class. And so if there was, if someone tried and failed to say it, for example, if we were to have preferred uh, calcineurin inhibitor and someone tried and failed that and we had all of the drugs grouped together in the same class, then that would be um, what would be needed to move on to, uh, say, an oral JAK inhibitor. I think that would probably be more in line with current recommendations and also, you know, in for clinician ease because it is step therapy. If someone is failing a TCI or another topical product, you generally want to move to a systemic therapy. Um, and, you know, having that as a separate category doesn't make as much sense to me at least. And Brian, you may have cut out a little bit there. I wasn't sure if we had a motion there or if that was just kind of having some more discussion. I, I have not heard a second motion yet.
And, and Brian, it's Joe. Uh, just for clarity, uh, because of technical issues, you may wish to restate your thoughts on topicals versus systemics, um, because I, I too, it, it seemed to drop out there for a second. Oh, okay. Um, I, I was just saying that I think that it, it makes sense to have a stepwise approach. Um, having one PDL class that includes all of the non steroidal treatments for atopic dermatitis could be an appropriate approach for accomplishing that. Um, you know, if, it's, if at some point there was new data or indications, we could um, move. Uh, be a natural way of of approaching a stepwise therapy. Seeing if there are any other thoughts on here, if we can kind of formulate that into a and Brian, I think I, I keep hearing kind of a cutout at a key time there. Um, I'm, I apologize. Keep them all together as one or, or do the stepwise and then, okay, and then you're saying that'll give us flexibility when guidelines update, when new studies are published. Right. Yeah. So if there was one class with all of the drugs, that would give us that flexibility to have a step or not. So Brian, again, this is Joe with the state. So a, a patient could could take one of the top, do one of the topicals, uh, the uh, calcineurins, and then and then move on to uh, a systemic. Um, Correct. Okay. Well, I, if there's any other discussion, please please chime in. But I would say consider including at least one systemic biologic agent, um, or, or I guess maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, include at least one um, non-topical agent FDA approved for moderate to severe AD. It does seem like <clears throat> on the PDL, I guess that would be my proposal. So that would, so that would be to not have steps? Um, I guess, yes, sorry. After failing um, an appropriate non-steroid topical agent. So either the calcineurin inhibitors or um, currently Crisoporo is the only one in that class. Okay. So after I, uh, failure of that, move on. I, I think perhaps the easier way to state that is just to say that they um, uh, they could all be in the same class. I'm trying to think of the best way to word that in a motion. Um, like, like I said, if there is, we've ha we have the motion in place for having the top, at least one preferred topical. And, and so a failure of a preferred is, is what's needed to get a non-preferred agent. Um, so something like um, all of the non-steroidal agents for atopic dermatitis are appropriate for inclusion on the preferred drug list without specifying what, what is preferred and non-preferred. Okay. Yeah, and not limiting it by route or mechanism of action, essentially. Okay. And I'll make that motion. I'll second that. And did we get a clear statement? It was we said including one agent. I just said I wanted to get the full motion there. We have the separate agent that addresses the topicals, so I think we're okay on this one. Perfect. <clears throat> all right. Well, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And any abstentions? All right. That motion carries. I'd like to make one additional motion, um, just that uh, the one I tend to make a lot of uh, grandfathering clause for those already um, on 
a particular uh, medication um, within this drug class that they not be forced to take something else if the PDL changes um, from what it is currently. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clayton. Um, all four. Aye. 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 All opposed? And any abstentions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Siegfried, for that motion. Um, that carries. And Joe, you kind of lit up on the screen there. I wasn't sure if you were saying something. Oh, oh. oh. oh but my apologies. All right. I believe that concludes uh, today's meeting, unless there is any, uh, <clears throat> any further discussion or any uh, other motions we'd like to discuss. Then I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. All right. Any abstentions? Thanks, everybody. Thank you.